Hello, lab experts. Welcome to the Rock Diagnostics podcast, the podcast where we discuss everything medical laboratory science in Africa and around the world. Today, we're having an interview with Anas Nasir, specialist biomedical scientist in hematology and transfusion. We are going to talk with him about one of his passions. That passion is letting the public know more about medical laboratory science and also empowering youths that may be interested in getting into the field. Without further ado, let's talk MedLab. Hello, Anas. Thanks for being here with us today. How are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me. I'm very good, thank you. How are you today? Ah, I'm all right for a Monday. I think it's fine. It's starting okay. So could you tell us, uh, tell the public a little bit more about you and what you do? Sure. So I'm a specialist biomedical scientist in hematology and transfusion from the UK. I work in a major London hospital and have a very um, big interest in morphology in particular, as well as general transfusion and hematology in general too. So my social media accounts I made mainly for the reason of learning myself and also passing that knowledge on because I enjoy learning and I enjoy teaching others too. And also, like you said in your introduction, we as uh, laboratory scientists, we tend to be hidden away and not many people know what we do or who we are. And so I use my social media accounts to speak a little bit about the work that we do behind the scenes in terms of short stories, in videos, in pictures, just to introduce the public to the fact there are people who do the testing behind the scenes. It's not just about doctors and nurses. Yep. Yeah, wonderful. You said you're interested in morphology. What sparked that interest in morphology? So in hematology, we do a lot of peripheral blood films. And um, when I first started, I was amazed by the amount you can learn just by looking down a microscope and seeing different cells. You know, whether patients got iron deficiency anemia to malaria to acute leukemias, you can all see that in a microscope. Yeah. But then the issue that I had when I was training, yes, the training was good, but there's only so much you can teach an individual, depending on what you are exposed to, what you see. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember people would tell me, look, this lymphocyte looks reactive, or this whole blood film looks reactive. And I'd be thinking to myself, how can a lymphocyte and how can a blood film be reactive? What does reactive mean? So I think one of the things about teaching is that you forget sometimes what you know and what the person you're teaching knows. And so you may be using terminology, which is very, very common to you. But which for somebody new, it may be completely different. And so small things like that um, made me question, you know, what it is I was learning. And so one day I was looking at a blood film and I found this very interesting looking cell. I didn't know what it was. And so I posted a picture of it on Twitter and on LinkedIn. And I had a few pathologists around the world commenting, saying what it could be. And then it became a thing. You know, I was like, oh, this is actually a good learning uh, tool sharing blood films on a regular basis, um, getting people involved, uh, sparking the conversation, seeing how people interpret things, learning as well as, you know, teaching as too. Yeah, and I think learning also as a student in the lab, sometimes it's quite complex, uh, especially when you have people who are at a certain level and you, you are down here and you start using words that you may not understand. And also sometimes even, I think, just the samples you're given, like you may not see mm -hmm. unless you're in a really large lab, some of the rarer samples, you may actually never see them, but there are things that you need to learn. So I think what you do, like by having those slides, those slides online helps a lot of people because some things they may not have been able to see during their practicals or during their internships, they can still see them online. And on a day where by chance a sample comes in where they're in front of that, they know what, or at least they know approximately what they have in front of them. Yeah. yeah, you're totally correct. And like you said, there's certain things that you may not see regularly because it might not be available in your part of the world or that condition may only be seen, um, you know, in specific locations. So, for example, recently we had a case of babesiosis um, in the UK, which is the first time we had it. Normally it's seen in America. And so though I'd 
knew of it through what I'd read and through pictures on social media. I'd never actually seen it for myself. Yeah. So when we got that case, I was like, oh, actually, I know what this is. And we identified the parasite correctly. All right. Now, what was under the scope, the first version of your sharing? So uh, the sharing is actually called Morphology Monday. And right. under the scope was the name of the channel. Right. Um, and that's how I got into um, social media use for learning and for pathology in general. I have used social media before, but that was more personal. And then I realized the benefits of, you know, learning and education through social media and under scope, scope was born. Yeah. So I guess what inspired you was essentially just at first wanting to learn for yourself. Exactly. Exactly. It was more about learning for me. There were many questions that I had, you know, which weren't answered. And I was hoping that, you know, what I've learned about the internet is that you're not the first person to have a problem. Somewhere, someone in the world has had the same problem. Yeah. And if you look on Google hard enough, you'll find an answer. Mm -hmm. And social, social media was one of those ways of finding the answers that I had. Yeah. And how do you gather the cases that you share? Are so most of the cases that we... Uh, so most of them are just from what we see in the lab. Uh, so what I see personally. And now occasionally, if somebody has an interesting case, they might send me pictures. So I've had a few cases from America, a few from other parts of the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, people who now know that I do the sharing of cases, they send me an email or a tweet saying, hey, look, I've got this interesting case. Would you like to feature it? Yeah. And um, so I do that too. That means the hospital in which you are should be kind of relatively large, right? For you to be able to have a wide variety, like enough of a variety to be able to share all the time. Exactly. So London is a very multicultural, diverse place with people from all over the world living here. And so people, when they go home to see families and friends, they always bring along with them things they may not want to intentionally. And so we get to see that in the lab. And also, it's the hospital I work in is a reference center for transplant and um, leukemias. So we see a lot of those too. Mm -hmm. And earlier on, you talked about sharing stories, interesting stories from the lab. Uh, what sort of stories do you tend to share? So what? Sure. So one of the first stories I wrote, it's a. Uh, it was based on Twitter, and it was called um, "It's a, a Day in the Life of a Biomedical Scientist." And um, it was about a patient we once had with AML. He was the same age as me. And I remember I knew everything about him. I'd never seen his face, but I knew his blood group. I knew his date of birth. I knew the type of music he was into from what the nurses said. And uh, one day we issued two platelets for the patient. He had two platelets every day, one in the morning and one in the evening. So as normal, I issued the platelets and um, the nurses, they never came to collect it. So I got somewhat worried. Um, I went for my lunch break. When I came back, the platelets were still there. Um, so I remember asking one of the nurses, um, you know, what's happened? Why haven't you collected the platelets? And she said the patient's passed away. And that was quite shocking for the whole lab because it's something that we don't really hear of. Um, though we care about the patients, we get to know them over time, we get to know their requirements, um, we know so many things that maybe they don't know themselves, but yet some of the most important things we don't know about. And um, so being my age, it was quite sombering and quite humbling um, for me too, to know that you know I'd helped him, but that now he was no longer there. Mm -hmm. And so that story, it was just to show that we in the lab, we care too. Even though we may not see the patients, there are patients as well. And we do our best to provide the best possible service we can from behind the scenes. Yeah, sometimes it's hard uh, to be able to figure out when those things are happening in the actual, in the clinical settings. Yep. But how does such information usually get relayed back to you, like in a larger hospital, like where you are? Sure. So because we, um, the lab is quite an open place, we get nurses and doctors always coming in and out. Um, we communicate with them. So, you know, I'm very open with the doctors, open with the nurses. We communicate a lot. So I always ask them, so how's this patient doing? What treatment are they on? What's the plan for the future? And um, so that patient I found out because one of the nurses had come in uh, collecting platelets and some blood products for another patient. So I asked, you know, why have you not taken the platelets for this patient? And we found out that way. Um Usually we don't find out um, in surgeries, for example, you know, you may issue lots of blood products for a patient in surgery and they don't use it. And that is the end of the end of that story, you could say. But it's quite sad. Um, and it's nice to know as well, even mm -hmm. though it's saddening, it's nice to have that closure to understand what happened. Mm -hmm. 
I guess you must have a really good relationship between at the hospital with, between the doctors, the nurses, and also you, because I know there are some labs where they tend to um, complain about that like bad relationships between them or lack of communication between them and the nurses and the doctors. That tends to pose problems in some cases. How do you uh, go about in ameliorating those sorts of um, working conditions? Sure. I think you must remember that, first of all, working in the lab, you are an expert at what you do. And the doctors are experts at what they do. So rather than causing problems for each other, you can help each other. You know, there's things that you know that they may not be aware of. And there's things that they know that you may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. And you must remember that everyone works in very stressful situations. So while we may be worried about a sample being incorrectly labeled, you know, they've got patients bleeding all over the uh, operating theater, for example. So it's about understanding where each other is coming from. And I find having that open communication, speaking to them regularly, building that rapport with each other, you know, getting to know them a bit better, you understand um, what they work like. And you know, this doctor is good for this thing, or this doctor is good for this. And you can go to them in whenever you need to. Mm -hmm. And as you communicate more, as you build up that relationship, they become more open too. And it makes it easier so you can reach out to them whenever you need. If you have a problem or you don't know something, you can contact them too. I've had issues during my shifts on the nights, for example, where I've had questions about something which I'm unsure about. And because I've got that good relationship with the doctors, I can just call them up and be like, hey, mm -hmm. I've got this question. What can I do? And likewise, the same, same the other way too. Um, sometimes I get calls from the doctors and they say, hey, I've got this query about this test. Who shall I contact? What can I do? And if I don't know the answer, I'm more than willing to pass it on to somebody who can help them better. Yeah. And so like I said, you know, it's understanding that, you know, everyone's working in a difficult situation. Sometimes I can come across as being, uh, you know, a bit rude or a bit angry. But if you stay calm and collected in that situation, Though I'm not justifying rudeness or anger over the telephone when you're communicating, I think if you keep calm on your end, then hopefully it calms the other person down too. And, um, you know, focus on what is common between both the departments, both the clinical side and both the um, laboratory side. I think, you know, sometimes there is that us and them attitude. And I've heard lots of um, people talk about, you know, it's us in the lab and them the doctors. And I think when you have that attitude somebody wins and somebody loses and in the end it's not the doctor who loses or the nurse who loses it's the patient that loses because at the end of the day you compromise on patient care by having that at attitude yeah i had a follow-up question on that but i think you essentially answered it so i was thinking uh, earlier on you were talking about being a specialist and so you know and there are some things you know better there are some things that you know better and then how do you figure out the dividing line. But I think from what you're saying, it's essentially about asking questions. So if you're unsure about exactly. something, you think something was wrong, then you should ask the question and then see what the reply is. And then yep. always and also it's a communication. Of course. And it's also about understanding your limitations too. Um, you know, no matter which uh, specialty you work in, there's so much to know, there's so much to learn. And, you know, me personally, I'm not an expert. I know some hematology and some transfusion science, but there's so much I don't know yet. And so I know what I know and I know what I don't know. So if I'm ever faced with a situation where I'm unsure, I know my limitations and I can say, hey, I don't know this, let me get some help. I think it's important to be able to say I need help. Sometimes we forget that, you know, um, everything that we do has an effect on the patient. And if we make a decision be it in the lab or be it in the clinical side, based on the unknown, based on something that we're unsure about, it can have severe repercussions for the patient. So, you know, just putting your hand up and say, look, I don't know this, let me ask, is better to go that way. Yeah, definitely. Now, going back to Mor Morphology Mondays and under the scope, uh, is there, how I put that, what's the most interesting case, you, according to you, that you've ever shared? Is there, or is there a case uh, you can share with us? Sure. I mean, we've had, so I do a lot of leukemias and a lot of, um, uh, you know, malaria, for example. I think the most interesting one that I shared, um, you may be aware that um, multiple infections are very rare in malaria. Mm -hmm. People tend to just get one. And though sometimes when you're looking at it on a blood film, um, it can seem that there's more than one infection because morphology quite, can be quite difficult to distinguish the various types of malaria. 
Um, so some, so PCR is the most, you know, best way of doing it. But once we had a case of a patient with three different um, infections in one go, yeah. and that was quite something. So not just one, but three. And it's rare enough to have two, let alone three. So that was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Speaking of malaria and morphology, um, I guess different people go about it different ways, but what would be your go-to technique? What do you look, what's the main thing you're looking for in trying to differentiate different species? So as I've said malaria, um, but malaria is probably not my strong point. I'm more of a, you know, leukemia guy. But um, I think it's interesting or it's important to be able to identify, first of all, that there's malaria present. Um, and if you're unsure, um, it's better to just call it falciparum. Um, so that treatment can be started because it is the most severe of the um, types. Um, and then you can differentiate afterwards. I think, you know, looking at bananas under a microscope, your falciparum gametocytes, they're quite obvious. Yeah, the trephozoites yeah. whites for falcip are quite easy to notice as well. When it gets to ovax, so ovali and uh, vivax, they, they can be somewhat difficult to distinguish between the two. I was teaching one of my junior colleagues about malaria speciation recently and trying to explain to them the very the differences between ovax um because they're so similar and um, it can be quite difficult unless you have a trained eye yeah it's one of the issues we have down here but i guess down here different the difference is malaria is so prevalent that in most that in most cases mm. even doctors just as young as falciparum and then start treating for falciparum from the start sometimes yeah well that may not be the best thing, but sometimes even before they get results from the lab, well, they have to make decisions because maybe the, the, the patient might be in a critical state, and so they start treating for, for falciparum while they actually wait for the results from, from the lab. Mm -hmm. I mean, recently we had a case of malaria uh, for an individual who traveled um, to Africa. He took his anti-malarial tablets and then after the three months he said, you know what, I don't need the tablets anymore. Mm -hmm. And so he got malaria. He came back to the UK and when we looked at the blood film, he had a parasitemia of 60%, 6 or 0. Mm -hmm. The highest I'd ever seen before that was about 10%. Yeah. And, you know, even 10% is very, very high. 60 he just, you know, blew my mind when I found out it was that high. Um but yes, he, he got treated straight away, and luckily he's, he's doing okay now. Yeah, wonderful. And where do you see Morphology Mondays going in the future? So as we alluded on previously, um, I'm going to continue my Morphology Monday on Twitter and LinkedIn by posting photos. I've started posting videos as well, um, showing the actual slides. Mm -hmm. um, I've moved on to a YouTube channel, so I can actually talk and explain the feature scene. I think using t uh, tweets is quite difficult because you can only um, mention or speak about limited things due to the limitation of characters on yeah. Twitter. So by using a video method, I think it'll be better. And I've also collaborated with uh, pathologists and scientists across the world to create a 50 second blood film. So it's literally just a blood film in 50 seconds where they do a voiceover explaining what you can see, the main features and a summary diagnosis. So hopefully YouTube will allow me to expand what I can share and actually explain some of the basics too. So not just sharing cases, but also understanding how do you identify what a neutrophil is or how do you distinguish between a monocyte and a lymphocyte. I know when I first started, one of the things that I struggled with the most was how do I know what's a reactive lymphocyte and what's a monocyte? Because sometimes they can look quite similar. Uh, so explaining those subtle differences as well, so that people who are new to morphology, um, who are learning and finding their way across the microscope, have a way of doing so. Mm -hmm. And how do you usually capture the images from the microscope? Do you use some special so, equipment? or It's very specialist. It's just a camera phone. <laughs> okay, yeah. Like you just hold it on it to take the pictures? So when I first started, I did just hold it. So all of my photos for Morphology Monday were taken using, uh, you know, me holding my breath, holding the phone, standing very, very still and taking the photographs. Yeah. But now I've got a mount. Um, it's basically a plastic mount, which you can put inside the objective lens and um, yeah. and holds it holds the phone still. It gives you better, you know, there's less wobble. Yeah. And so the images are a bit clearer. I see. Is it one of those uh, 3D printed mounts? Uh, no, I just bought it on off the internet. It was quite cheap, yeah. I remember a while back I was seeing also some 3D prints and you could actually print them yourself and then put them. It seemed quite interesting. Mm. 
Uh, okay, so one last thing. How did you decide to get into MedLab? What was the spark and has it grown into an all-consuming fire? So when I first um, started at university, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do as such. I enjoyed my science and I knew that I wanted to go into something healthcare related. So I decided to study biomedical science at university. And though I did that, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do at the end of it, mm -hmm. because we had a um, Carez day, one lecture in which the presenter said, after studying this degree, you can go into teaching, you can go into medicine, you can go into research, you can go into anything you like. And um, so I thought to myself, you know, what is it that I would like? Let me try research. So I did a year of a master's degree in a research-based project working with zebrafish following differentiation of stem cells. And though I enjoyed the science a lot, I found you have to be very, very passionate about research if you want to go into it. You know, I'd be in the lab from 7 o'clock in the morning sometimes till 7 to 8 o'clock at night. You know, it'd be a long day. And though I enjoyed it, I was like, you know what, this is not for me. So then I decided to pursue a diagnostics route. Um, so going to a di diagnostics lab. Um, I worked in a hospital as a lab assistant and I quite enjoyed what I did. And from there, I got my registration as a biomedical scientist and worked my way up. I think as I've learned more about hematology and transfusion, and my passion has increased for it, you know, and also the things that I do outside the lab, the outreach events with students at colleges and also inviting students to our lab to see what we do, the public um, work we do as well. Every year there's a healthcare science week here in the UK and we take our stall and in a public place of the hospital um, and we show people a microscope, for example, or blood units and answer any questions they may have about the lab because most of the time samples are taken and they never get to see what happens to them or they never know where they go. Um, so just opening up the doors. So I think I've grown in that way. I've, my passion for um, working in the lab has increased and hopefully it continues to do so. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Anas, for sharing your experience with us and for being with us today. Where can people get in touch with you? I mean, I'm available on Twitter. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on everything now, Snapchat, YouTube. Yeah. So any of those platforms you can reach me on. Um, um, you can even contact me by email. Um, hopefully I'll, uh, we can share that at the end of the podcast. Yeah. Um, so my Twitter is under the underscore scope. Um, okay. So if anyone wants to follow me on there. Um, but from there, I'm available. I'm happy to talk. I'm happy to speak and um, learn as well. So if you've got something to teach me, please do get in touch. I love learning and hopefully we can learn from each other. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. So there you have it, lab experts. I hope you've been able to learn something throughout this interview. I know I learned a lot. Uh, don't forget to follow Anas on Twitter under the scope. Uh, we'll put actually the link to his various profiles in the comment section. Also, if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time to talk more MedLab.